Okay, hi there, and uh, welcome to a macroeconomics video. Uh, many students, of course, will be covering supply side economics, supply side policies, and competitiveness as part of uh, A level economic studies. So I thought I'd take a few minutes to think about some of the key indicators for the UK economy, focusing initially on this question what are some of the major supply side weaknesses of the UK economy? Well, there are many, and uh, these are some of the key weaknesses we came up with in class during a discussion a few days ago. Uh, and I'm going to focus on perhaps four or five of them in this video. We don't really have time to look at everything. In the UK, there is a relatively low level of research and development spending, particularly by businesses, and that can hold back competitiveness and innovation. Linked to that is the fact that the UK has a relatively low level of capital investment spending in things like new technologies, factories, and machinery and so forth. Businesses complain that there are skills shortages in the labour market in key sectors and that the ageing infrastructure of the UK is a factor holding back business and increasing their costs. To what extent is relatively low geographical and occupational mobility a supply side weakness? As to the fact that there are millions of people in this country of working age who for one reason or another are categorised as economically inactive. Are there weaknesses in the management of UK businesses? Do we have perhaps, whilst we have some world-class businesses, perhaps we have a tale of underperforming businesses that haven't reached their full potential? We know also that there are significant, long-standing, deep-rooted regional economic imbalances. The gap between rich and poor, both within and between regions in the UK, is significant. And many of you will have covered one of the key supply-side weaknesses, which is the persistent productivity gap in terms of output per worker employed or output per hour worked. Perhaps the overriding, if you like, bit of evidence that the UK does have a relatively weak supply side at the moment is the fact that the British economy runs a big external trade deficit. The value of the goods and services that we import is significantly above the value of our exports. Indeed, the external deficit peaked at over 5% of GDP in 2018. Perhaps a sort of ex post bit of data that the supply side needs to improve. What I thought I'd do in this video is just take you through one or two bits of data uh, to help uh, encourage you to apply data in your exam questions. And hopefully uh, these, this, these bits of data from charts and things will, will tell an interesting story. Let's look first of all at research and development spending as a share of GDP. The black line in this chart is the average for OECD countries, so basically a club of about 30, 35 high-income advanced countries. I've chosen countries such as Finland and Germany, Israel, Korea and Mexico for points of contrast with the UK. But you can see, hopefully, if you look at the bottom right, that UK research and development is well below 2% of GDP and well below the OECD average. 1.7% uh, of GDP contrasts with Israel, which is spending nearly 5% of its national income and research and development. A lot of that linked to defence and technology companies. Finland, close to 3%, all of that figures come down in recent times. Germany spends about 3% of their national output on R&D, heavily influenced, of course, by pharmaceuticals and the automotive sector. And I think a really good example here is South Korea, 4.5% of GDP and rising. Often associate that with businesses such as Samsung and Hyundai and, I and uh, Kia Motors. And, and many others. The British government has a target to lift research and development spending to 2.4% of GDP within the next seven years. And it wants, it, uh, wants, the UK, wants the UK to be the most innovative country in the world. That is, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, an ambitious target. One of the other supply side weeks is often mentioned in essays is the fact that the UK has a relatively low capital investment spending as a share of the GDP. And I've taken a chart looking at a range of countries here. The UK does come at the bottom of this list of countries, well below investment in, in countries such as Mexico, Germany, Singapore, and of course, clearly, China. Now, why is investment low as a share of GDP? Well, perhaps it's the case that we have more service industries, which tend to invest less, contrasted with heavy manufacturing. Perhaps our, perhaps our tax system doesn't provide enough incentives for businesses to invest. And indeed, the behaviour of businesses themselves, the choices that corporations make, 
can also be a factor, with a preference perhaps for share buybacks to lift the share price and handing out generous dividends rather than investing profits in real investment. Public sector investments being held back by a decade of fiscal austerity, and there is some uh, economic literature which suggests that the financial markets may, need, may be failing to provide the sort of funding in uh, finance that businesses need to invest, that uh, short-termism in the city, desire for quick paybacks, is a factor holding back the flow of capital to growing businesses who need to invest. Another supply side indicator is productivity. This chart shows an index of GDP per hour worked since, uh, well, since the uh, early 1990s. And in particular, it's the index, uh, the, sorry, the index is uh, based to the year 2010, which is handy because it tells us a little bit about what's happened to productivity in those countries since the turn of the decade. Uh, South Korea has achieved a 23% rise in GDP per hour worked. Germany closing on the 9%, Mexico a shade under 7%. But can you see again, bottom right, that the UK's productivity growth has been fairly flat. Indeed, it's only risen by about 3% since 2010. Low productivity growth is a key supply side weakness. Another measure of supply side performance comes from sort of surveys, peer-reviewed surveys of competitiveness. One I wanted to point to is the global competitiveness uh, position for the UK, published each year by the World Economic Forum. In 2018, the UK was ranked eighth in the world out of 140 countries surveyed. We dropped to ninth in 2019. So we are still in the top 10 for competitiveness, which is good news. But if you dig beneath the data a little bit, you start to see some supply side problems emerging. For example, we know we're not in the top 30 countries of those surveyed in terms of ICT adoption. We're 33rd in terms of overall health outcomes. We know there's a big gap in health outcomes between different parts of the population. Our road system is full of holes, literally, and under pressure. We're 29th in digital skills. We're 79th out of 140 in fixed internet access, in having those fast fibre broadband connections coming into homes and businesses. We're 50th in terms of internal labour mobility. Uh, the problems of renting homes, the costs of commuting, clearly limiting people's mobility of labour. And again, we're close to 50th in the world in terms of having high pupil-teacher ratios, particularly, I think, in primary education. Now, these are little bits of information, if you like, which are little snapshots suggesting that our competitiveness is being held back in relative terms by some problems in infrastructure, uh, connectivity and uh, education spending. And linked to education is something called the PISA rankings. Now, these come out every few years. The latest tests were in 2018. And the PISA rankings are basically standardised tests across countries in reading, mathematics and science. And the UK, uh, to be fair, the UK uh, has risen in the PISA rankings, 14th in reading, uh, 14th in science, 18th in maths. So there has been an improvement in our PISA scores, our relative PISA scores in recent times, which is good news. That said, uh, in the UK, advantaged students, uh, students coming from postcodes and schools with much more significant economic and social advantages, they outperformed disadvantaged pupils in reading by 80 score points in the latest PISA rankings. Again, a big issue you could put into an essay, educational disadvantage, relative disadvantage, uh, supply side weakness for the UK. However, uh, although I have, I have focused on weaknesses and limitations, I just want to finish with uh, six examples, six reasons to be cheerful for the UK supply side. The first is renewable energy. This is a sector, solar farms, wind turbines, etc. Clean renewable energy. This is an industry now in the UK worth nearly 50 billion pounds a year. And uh, as the industry scales up its investment and capacity, so the unit costs and prices will continue to fall. So renewables is looking good. So too is life sciences. Uh, this contributes over £30 billion a year to the economy and supports probably now over half a million jobs. Life sciences involves the application of biology and technology 
to health improvement. Things like biopharmaceuticals, medical technology, genomics, health diagnostics, all that kind of stuff. A significant sector now in the UK on the supply side. Our creative industries, from film to TV, radio, photography, live music, advertising agencies, galleries, digital creative industries, uh, is really a thriving industry now worth more than £100 billion a year. So those are three industries where there is a lot of supply side investment and growth. Good news. Fintech, from peer-to-peer lending, new payment systems, blockchain technologies, etc., emerging challenger banks. Fintech is a sector in the UK that's doing pretty well. So too, higher education. We still have nearly 20 universities ranked in the top 100 universities in the world. Although, of course, it'll be interesting to see the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis on, on the financing of UK universities. And finally, nanotechnology, uh, those whose uses include cosmetics, textiles, medicine. Again, the UK is devel- developing some world-leading capacity, some world-leading capability in nanotechnology. So there we go, some reasons to be cheerful. There are some significant supply-side weaknesses in the UK, which we've been through, and I think it's important to balance them out as best you can. Okay, thank you very much indeed.